Cooper Talk Mysteries. I'm Julie Cooper, a thriller and mystery writer and half of the duo presenting this podcast series, spotlighting mystery, suspense, and thriller fiction. First, thanks again to my brother, Chris Squires, for our wonderful theme song, The Man in the Panama Hat. This is a very special episode for Kendall and Cooper. It's our 50th podcast devoted to mystery and suspense fiction and the creative people, otherwise known as writers, who craft their imaginative words and imaginary worlds into compelling stories. Our theme today speaks to inspiration, that big idea or niggling little fact that a writer just can't leave alone, even if it takes years to bring that creative vision to completion. Our special guest, a successful career novelist, has firsthand experience with this and tackled a provocative subject that grapples with science and faith, tightly wrapped around a thriller. The book's tagline is, Kill to Get It, Die to Keep It. I just finished this book on Audible, and I loved it. That brings me to introduce our special guest, a highly awarded, on both sides of the Atlantic, British mystery thriller writer who's an international bestseller and a regular on the New York Times bestseller lists. He's been nominated for or awarded almost every mystery thriller award I can think of, including the CWA Diamond Dagger Award, the Barry Award, and the Rhineback Award. In fact, he was the first time ever recipient of the Rhineback Glass Dagger Award, doesn't that sound lethal, for excellence in crime fiction in 2017. Three of his novels have been turned into films, and several more have been adapted for the stage. It was such a pleasure to see him this summer in New York at Thriller Fest. With over 19 million books sold worldwide, welcome author Peter James. It's such a thrill to have you join us and tell us about your challenging big idea for your newest book. Thanks. It's, it's great to talk to you guys. Well, I'm going to jump right into some questions for you. And your newest book, Absolute Proof, some might say, is the book of a lifetime for you. What can you tell us about your protagonist, Ross Hunter, who, unlike most of your other heroes, is not a cop? Ross is an investigative journalist. And when I was writing Absolute Proof, something struck me. I was shadowing a couple of investigative journalists in in the UK, and I realized that actually, although I'm best known for my crime thriller series centered around Detective Roy Grace, but the work of an investigative journalist is very similar to the work of a detective, in that they both are digging deep beneath the surface at, at any you know, for the, for the journalist, it's a story for the detective that's trying to find the truth. Um, and both journalists and police officers have another kind of great similarity. In that the journalist has a press card, the police officer has a warrant card or a shield, which enables them to go behind the scenes, behind the curtains of almost any aspect of, of life. So they tend to see the world differently to most people. Uh, And the reason I chose an investigative reporter was for this story, for absolute proof, I felt it was the right person as as the protagonist um, because the whole journey that I had in in writing this book and 29 years I worked on this novel, for me it was digging all the time just as an investigative journalist might. Wonderful. Well, and I'm, my next question also is about absolute proof. It has a most unusual, some could even say bizarre beginning. And the book's theme is a battle of faith versus science, which seems especially timely now. 
it's certainly not the usual approach for a thriller. Can you tell us how you got started with this story? And I know it's been something that's gone on over a number of years. Yeah, it was back in 1989. Um, uh, it was before I was ex-directory. Luckily, now it turns out, I, I got a phone call one afternoon out the blue from an elderly sounding guy. And he said, uh, is that Peter James, the author? And I go, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, thank God I found you. It's taken me two weeks. So I phoned every Peter James in the phone book in England. Oh. Mr. James, I go, okay, I'm thinking, do I hang up now? <laughs> What's he trying to sell me? Uh, uh, and he said, Mr. James, I, I'm not a nutcase. I was a bomber pilot during the Second World War. I'm a recently retired university academic. I have been given absolute proof of God's existence. And I've been told you are the man to help me get taken seriously. I go, right. He says, Mr. James... <laughs> I, I need to come and see you. You and I have to save the world. I'm going to need four days of your time. <laughs> and I said, I beg your pardon, four days. I said, I'm pretty busy. You know, I'm flat out on a, on a new book right now. But I was intrigued. And I said, do you want to just tell me a little bit more? And he said, yes. He said, my wife recently died of cancer. Um, before she died, we made an agreement that I would go to a medium and try and communicate with her uh, some, some months after her death. And I did this. And instead of my wife coming through, a male came through who said he was a representative of God, that God was extremely concerned about the state of the world and felt that if mankind could have faith in him reaffirmed, it would get us back on an even keel. And as proof of his bona fides, he revealed to me three pieces of information nobody on earth knows. And he said, the author, Peter James, is the person to help you get taken seriously. He said, I go, okay. <laughs> and he said, I, said, I said, and what are these three pieces of information? He said, Mr. James, if you're willing to see me, I will reveal them to you. And his name was Harry Nixon, he told me. So I thought I was intrigued enough to just to take this to the next step. So I said, look, I can meet you for half an hour for a cup of tea, and if we need more time, we take it from there. He said, fair enough. And I arranged the following. He lived up in the north of England. And I arranged the following Tuesday afternoon. I thought 4 o'clock would be a good time because my wife would have been home at half five and could have biffed him on the head if he had me in a stranglehold. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> good idea. He, he arrived at the house. He looked like a kind of retired bank manager, you know, nicely dressed, with his rather roomy old man eyes, and he shook my hand, and he said, Mr. James, you and I have to save the world. And I said, you know, I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, sat him down, got him a cup of tea, and I said, you know, where, where do we start? And he took this manuscript out of his attaché case, and about a thousand pages long, he said, you start by reading this. I said, fine, leave it with me. He said, no, no, this was channeled to be my God. I, I can't let this out of my sight. I said, it would take me four days to read this. He said, I told you. Ah. <laughs> said, so you're going to sit there for four days while I read it. He said, yeah, yes. I said, it's not going to happen. And this is the point I start thinking, oh, my God, this guy is a nutter. Anyhow, I said to him, what are the three pieces of information? And he said, I have been given the compass coordinates for the location of the tomb of Akhenaten. Akhenaten was Tutankhamun's uncle and the first monotheist Egyptian pharaoh. So I've been given the location, compass coordinates for the location of the Holy Grail and for the location of the Ark of the Covenant. And, and I think, okay. I said, have you looked for any of these? He said, yes. So the Holy Grail is a place called Chalice Well in Glastonbury in Somerset, which is in the west of England. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd never heard of Chalice Well. Uh, subsequently, he then told me, he said, Chalice Well is a holy site on the edge of the, of the town, and it's where Joseph of Arimathea was rumored to have bought the Holy Grail after the crucifixion and concealed it. He said, it's run by a group of trustees. He said, you know, I can navigate. I was a pilot in the war. I have been on exactly these compass coordinates. I've been dowsing, I've been metal detecting, and there's something under the ground. I've asked the trustees for permission to do an archaeological dig, but they won't take me seriously. But, Mr. James, I think they might take you seriously. 
Anyhow, long story short, he leaves it with me. I, I start to read the manuscript, and I have 20 pages in, I lose the will to live. It's just <laughs> ramblings, <laughs> tracks to the Bible, annotations. But by sheer, sheer chance, the next day, I had to go to Bristol, which was not that far from Somerset, to do a, a BBC radio interview. And I'm finished the interview, and I'm just chatting with the presenter, and out of the blue, she mentions Chalice Well. And I felt this shiver run down my spine. I thought, this is very weird. I've never heard of Chalice Well. I'm told I've been the man chosen to save the world, and now I'm hearing it twice in two days. And I said to the presenter, what, what do you know about Chalice Well? So oh, my uncle's a trustee. So now I'm thinking, um, hmm, what is going on? What is going on? And I laughed. I told her the story, and I, I kind of laughed. And I, and I phoned a friend of mine who at the time was Bishop of Reading. And I went to see him. And he's a very modern-thinking clergyman. Um, you know, both his parents were doctors. He had a double first in psychology. So you know, he's not kind of traditional old school. And his name is Dominic Walker. And I said to him, you know, I told him the story. I said, what do you think? And Dominic said, well, firstly, proof is the enemy of faith. He said, secondly, I would want more than three sets of compass coordinates to have proof of God's existence. I said, what would you want? He said, I would want something that, that defies the laws of physics of the universe and a pretty impressive miracle. And I said, if somebody could deliver that, what then? He said, do you know what I really think? They'd be assassinated because who? Whose God would it be? You've got all the different factions of the Anglican Church, Catholic, Judaic, Islamic, Sikhs, all would be claiming ownership. And you'd have communist countries like China would not want a higher power usurping their authority. And I just thought, yes, I have got the makings of a fantastic thriller here. Mm. And that's my starting point. Absolutely. And it goes on from there at record light speed. Now, talking about another book, your standalone novel, The House on Cold Hill, which is, I think, becoming a stage play in the United Kingdom, has a paranormal theme and setting. And you've also worked as a screenwriter. So could you enlighten us on how a scene in your novel di differs from the same scene in your play? Well, the great thing as a novelist, and, and, and I've always loved that I, I worked, before I became a full-time novelist, I worked in film and television. Um, and you, in a novel, you are free. You don't have the budget uh, that a movie director, movie, movie producer or television producer has. So if you want to have uh, a train going over a precipice in a novel, you can just write it. You haven't got to... I haven't got a producer going, oh, my God, that would cost me $2 million to film. Um, and with the stage play, you've got a, even a stage further restriction in that for a play to work, you have to have a, a very small number of cast. And you literally can't, you can't have car chases. Right. <laughs> very, <laughs> and you can't have train crashes. You, you, know, you can't have all the kind of action you can put in the pages of a novel. Um, you know, a stage play is very largely done by, by dialogue, um, in, a, in a scary or a thriller play, you have some, you can have special effects, but you're very restricted seeing you have to re reduce, you know, and probably in, in, in my average novel, I've got, you know, maybe five to 10 kind of significant characters and maybe 40 to a hundred less significant ones mm -hmm. that they've got to be condensed in a stage play from between about five to to, to nine people maximum. And with the House on Cold Hill, which is a ghost story and, and, and there's some very creepy goings on, again, it's trying to make that play really modern. Uh, I mean, the book is a ghost story, although it's, again, it's it's set in, in modern times. And again, it's based on, uh, so much I write is based on my own experience. And the House on Cold Hill came out of the fact that I, I actually lived in a really seriously haunted house during the 90s. Um, I, 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 I kind of had had some big success with my kind of earlier novel, Possession, which is a supernatural thriller, and, and the sequel, Dreamer. 
And my then wife and I did the dream, and we bought this big, beautiful Georgian wreck of a country house um, with the plan to spend the next you know, 10 years doing it up while we lived in it. And the day we bought, the day I was buying the house, the owner said to me, he said, oh, you're like this with what you write with your supernatural thrillers. Well, we, we got three ghosts. Actually, he lied. There were four. Oh, wow. Uh, 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 bonus. Uh, it was a real bonus. Yeah, you, you, it was buy, a bonus. <laughs> buy, three, get, buy three ghosts, get one free. You know? There you go. Um, and, but the, the story of that was fascinating because my then mother-in-law was a very down-to-earth lady. She was a judge, but she also had a fey side, and, and she would always know if a member of the family was going to die. She'd have a particular dream, or if there's anybody she knew was going to die. And the day we moved in, this house was really isolated. We, my wife and I that had always been townies. We'd never lived in the country before. Um, the removals men were carrying all the stuff in, and I was standing in the porch with my mother-in-law, watching the guys carrying all the packing cases. And there was a long hallway, oak-panelled, which opened into this oak panel like an atrium that you walked into, it's like an anteroom before mm. the kitchen. And I was standing with my mother-in-law, and we were watching the removals man, and I just suddenly saw this shadow move across that anteroom. And she looked at me and she said, did you see that? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, she's seen something. Uh, and my, my, my then wife was not at ease at all with moving to the countryside, to this remote, dark house. Um, and the last thing I wanted to do was see a ghost on day one. So I just said, no, I didn't see anything and left it at that. And the next day, my, my Georgina was a lawyer, and she went off to work. And I was up in my study writing, and I went down about half ten to get a cup of coffee. And I walked into this anteroom, and all these tiny pinpricks of light, some no bigger than a pinhead, some about the size of a thumbnail, were floating in the air. And I thought, maybe it's my glasses catching the sunlight the wrong way, so I took my glasses off, put them back on, and these pinpricks had all gone. Lunchtime, I went down to make a sandwich, and the same thing again. I see these lights floating in the air, and, and the same in the afternoon. And I decided not to say anything when Georgina came home at in the evening. I, I thought maybe my my mind just sort of gone into overdrive with the guy telling us about the ghost, and then my mother-in-law, whatever she might have seen or thought she saw. So I keep quiet about it. And the next day, we have a, a, a dog, a Hungarian Puli. A, uh, called Jesse, and I took Jess for a walk down the, down the lane, and this old boy came up to me. He said, "Are you Mr. James, Peter James, the author?" And I said, "Yes." He said, "And you just bought the manor?" And I said, "Yes." He said, uh, "How are you getting on with your grey lady then?" And I said, "What grey lady?" And he told, us, told me that he used to house it for the previous owner. They had another thing when they went for the winter, and he said, "This anteroom." They'd made it into a snug, and he had a, a chair in there, an armchair, and a television. It was sort of next to the kitchen, so they had the heat from the Arger oven from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. He said, I was sitting there one Sunday evening, watching television, and this woman in grey silk crinoline with a really angry face just came out of one wall, glided across towards me, and she flicked my face with the edge of her dress. It actually stung my cheek, and she vanished into the oak panelling behind me. He said, I was out there. I've not set foot. I would, wild horses wouldn't get me back in your house. Oh. And I, I thought, okay, maybe he's a little bit batty, maybe. Uh, and so I still don't say anything to, to my wife when she came home. But the following Sunday, we invited her parents to lunch. And I took her mother aside and I said, what did you see that, that day we were moving in? And she described this woman exactly, exactly as this guy had. So then I told my wife, and she said, actually, I've seen her several times. I didn't want to tell you and spook you out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. So it definitely wasn't an empty house. <laughs> no, no. We got plenty more than we bargained for. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, now, I've looked at your website a 
Peter, and you offer some very helpful writing tips there on PJTV. But I've wondered if you have any writing rituals that you observe. I know when I spoke to your wonderful wife, Laura, um, the summer in New York, that she said you have a specific time in the early evening when you like to write. And sometimes even with a vodka martini in hand, are there any other habits that help your creative juices flow? Yeah, I mean, my, I, I, as a writer, I, I, I believe, you know, and I, it's how I make my living. And I, I feel that you always basically have to write and just get on with it. You know, and, and so my first rule is that once I've started a novel, I will write a minimum of a thousand words a day, six days a week, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. Um, so, you know, people often say to me, do you ever get writer's block? And I, and I, I look at them and I'll say, well, you're a lawyer, do you get lawyer's block? <laughs> or... You're a, you're a plumber, do you get plumber's block? Or you're a police officer, do you get police officer's block? Oh, I can't arrest anybody today, I'm blocked, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you make a living doing something, you just get on with it. And yes, I, I might get writer's block for 30 minutes, in which case I'll take the dogs for a walk around, around, around the grounds um, or whatever and, and solve the problem. But so I've got used to writing over the years, literally anyone, I've traveled a huge amount on book promotion. So I can write, I write in the back of a car, I can write in a hotel lobby. I love writing in hotel rooms because I'm away from all the distractions. I pick up the phone, coffee arrives, whatever. But, um, I've finished two novels on long haul flights because again, away from the distractions. But my ideal writing time is six in the evening till about 9.30 at night. And I got into this habit when I was working full-time in film and television. And I, you know, I started writing my novels. I made it my me time. That was when I would turn off the internet, whatever, not answer phone calls, and just focus. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of created like a ritual, um, which, I, which I love, which is I, I make a vodka martini. It has four olives. Um, and I, I, I make it a kind of very special way. It's, it's a potent drink, but it kind of, it's my rocket fuel. Oh. And, I, and, I, and I put on music, and the first three quarters of a book, I play kind of wide range from jazz, the certain rock music I, I listen to, um, certain musicians, I love Van Morrison, I love the Kinks. Oddly enough, I can't write to the Beatles or the Stones. For some reason, I love the music, but it, it distracts. And then the last quarter of, of a book, I put on opera arias, and they just sort of seem to lift me and carry me and help the momentum. Um, and sometimes I have a cigar as well. Um, I, I, I look forward to that sort of six o'clock in the evening so much. Um, I, you know, I know so many writers who say, oh, you know, I, I struggle with writing. Uh, and for me, I guess having that kind of Vodka martini to look forward to. It's my treat. And I just sit down and I get in the zone. And I'm really happy when I write. And I think that's true of a lot of writers that I've spoken to or, or that we've interviewed is they say when they're not writing, they're often thinking about writing. And, and then when they don't, aren't able for whatever reason to write, they often are not very nice people. They said they're, they're grouchy and, and sort of out of sorts. So... Um, I think having a regular routine is really essential to to anyone who aspires to being, you know, to finishing a book and to be a career novelist. So thank yes. you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, yes. I, I, I totally agree. I think the, the key thing is people say to me, oh, well, you know, it's all, very, it's all very well for you, but, you know, I got four kids and how do I do this? And, and, and what I say answer is, you don't have to write a thousand words a day. You know, Graham Greene, who I think is one of the greatest novelists ever, wrote 351 a day in longhand with a pencil, and he'd stop at that number. It's writing an amount anybody can find. Nobody's going to tell me they couldn't find 30 minutes a day to write even 100 words. And I, what is important is, I think is, is the flow. And it doesn't matter what the word count is, whether you're writing 100 words or 1,000 or, or 5,000 words a day, is to write, I think, six days a week. Let your brain kind of switch off that one day. 
but you keep in a rhythm then. If you only write like on a Sunday, then don't write for another week. You'll be out of all the rhythm of, of the story. I agree. That there's definitely a difference between the discipline and, and you know, trying to make it a, a real routine. Um, yeah. Something you said when we met in New York, you said having your house burgled or robbed was a strangely helpful step in moving your writing career forward. Can you explain that for our listeners? Yeah, I'll, I'll go one step further. I'll say that, that being burgled was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me in my career. And ah. it, was, it was 1981, and I just got married. And got, we got burgled. And I just had my first book published as well, which was a not very good spy thriller called Dead Letter Drop. And we got burgled, and this young cop came to take fingerprints. Um, and he saw my book. And he said, oh, yeah, if you ever want research help with the police, give me a call. And he was married. He was he was a detective, and he was married to a detective. And my 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 former wife and I became friends with them. They invited us to a house to a barbecue, and there were a dozen of their other friends there, and they were all also police officers, as is very often the case. And they were you know, across the whole spectrum from homicide detectives, response officers. Uh, neighborhood policing team, uh, crime scene investigators, police diver. And I found these people absolutely fascinating to talk to. And I, over the next sort of couple of years, our sort of friendship grew, not only with, with Mike and Ren Harris, the original two, but we started becoming, just naturally becoming friends with some of their other friends as well. And I was spending more and more time in, in, in the kind of police social world and when they realized i was genuinely interested and not just out to get a story i could sell to a newspaper they'd started to invite me to come out and patrol with them or spend a day in an office and it got to the point where they'd, they'd phone me up and say oh, we've got an interesting crime scene do you want to come along and i just started to realize that as a writer uh for a writer nobody sees more of human life in a, in a 30-year career than a police officer you know, they, they, they can go to, you know, and, and it's more than just solving crimes. It's all the kind of human side of their work as well. And over the years, I started putting more and more police seeds into my early sort of thrillers. And then and I became very friendly with a, with a detective called Dave Gaylor, who was a young detective inspector in Brighton. And over the next eight years, he rose and became detective chief superintendent, head of major crime. The Sussex, at a time my publishers asked if I'd ever thought of creating a, writing a crime series and creating a detective as a central character. So I went to Dave and I said, you know, how would you like to be a fictional cop? And he just loved the idea. And we, we work together on every Roy Grace novel. We, we sit down, we have a particular corner table in a, in a, in a pub near, near my home, and we have, take a brand new moleskin notebook and we kind of plan the plotting out. And then I go away and write the first 100 pages. He then reads them, tells me how Roy Grace and my other police characters would kind of really think and react. Um, and then we, we discuss what other kind of contacts within the police I need for any particular scene. And, and we sort of built up this huge network, both in, of police officers in England and in the United States uh, and in many other countries of the world who I've been out with. And I said earlier that you know, what fascinates me about the police is not just the, so the crime solving, but it is almost their social work status. I'm just to give an example where I mean, I regularly go out the, with the police in the UK, and I recently did a 12-hour shift with the duty inspector at, at Brighton. So he's in charge of kind of every, what they call, critical incident that comes in. And 7 o'clock in the morning, just after we started, we get a phone call from a, there's a, a cop death. I don't know, if, do, you call it, do you call it cop death in America? Sudden infant death? This yes. Couple, they're three months, yes. Yeah, this couple, three months old babies died at some point during the night. So they, are, they are devastated. They are absolutely on the floor with grief and distress. Right. And they've got to give pastoral care to these people 
But at the same time, they have to be mindful that just maybe these people murdered the baby. So it's a crime scene. And that's a really difficult line for them to have to sort of travel, travel down. Um, an hour later, we were called a Turkish student's hit by a bus in the middle of Brighton. The paramedics say he's going to die. His girlfriend doesn't speak a word of English. I have to try and find a translator, calm her down. Luckily, she survives. An hour and a half later, we're at the house of an elderly couple who've just been swindled out of their life savings by an online fraudster. Mm. And, and the day goes on. And then, sorry, yeah, then at about 11 o'clock, we get a phone call from this woman, um, a 45-year-old woman, smart, bright, intelligent lady. Her living boyfriend's just put dog feces in her mouth. And... and they, 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 you just see all these facets of human life, and the police have to deal with that as much as they have to deal with some uh, villain who's Nick vandalizing a car or just mugged somebody in the street. You know, they have all this going on as well, and that really fascinates me about their world. They, they truly see the best and the worst of human behavior, which for a novelist gives you so many venues of uh, inspiration, I think. Totally. I mean, that's a great line. I, a police officer, a friend of mine, said, we, we are always going into someone's worst situation. Mm. And it's so true. Mm. Uh, yeah, not many people call the police because they're happy. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> now, hey, speaking I'm of... I'm 911 because I'm feeling happy. Thought you'd like I'm, to know. I'm having such a grand day, I decided to give you a call, yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, now, I know you've written a Roy Grace book, I think, every year since 2005, starting with Dead Simple. And there are also a host of standalone novels appearing over that time, including your newest one, Absolute Proof. So we've talked a little bit about writing and discipline, but I'm, I'm just wondering, have you always been this organized, or was this something that developed over your career as a very successful novelist? I... I guess I'm disciplined more than organized in that, in that I, I, I absolutely love writing my Roy Grace novels. Um, and I have, I have to deliver one a year. Um, but it, it seems to sort of come and flow. I mean, every time I start a new book, and I don't know if you, you guys feel the same when you're writing, but I, <laughs> I get it. I get about 30, 40 pages in, and I think, oh, my God, this is not going to work. I've got away with it in the last few books. <laughs> this one's going to screw up. Mm. And it's interesting. I, I'm, I was with Lee Child and Martina Cole at, at a writer's conference in England a few months back, and we, we're having a drink outside. And I said to Lee, I said, you know, do you, guys, do you guys feel the same? And he said, absolutely. And Martina Cole said, absolutely. And it seems to me that most writers I ever talked to had that same feeling of panic that, oh, shit, we're finally going to get found out that actually we're not really any good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, I, what, I, what I, I love my Roy Grace novels and, 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 and writing about the whole police world and, 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 and great crimes, but there are certain subjects that I, I want to explore that don't work within, or wouldn't really work that well within the confines of a, of a, crime, of a detective thriller. Um, so, you know, with absolute proof, it was a classic example. You know, I wanted to write a thriller about, set around the, the whole world of kind of religion and, and science. Um, and it wouldn't really have worked to have made it a Roy Grace novel, so it needed to be a standalone. Um, and I think, I, I think you guys know it's, for a, it's launched in America as, as an exclusive on Audible, which is a really interesting experiment. And it's been narrated by, Hugh Bonneville of, of Downtown Abbey fame, who's done an extraordinary job. And there is something quite magical about an audio book. I mean, storytelling, the original origins of storytelling was the oral tradition. Uh, and in parts of India today, you still have the oral storyteller who goes from village to village. Um, and I've only recently started really getting into listening to audio books. But you get a connection with the author that's even stronger than 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 you, than, I, than you actually get reading the printed page. I I'd agree. There's something, and listening to Hugh's voice, he did just a masterful job on that that audible uh, 
production just amazing. Um, there's something about the rhythm, the cadence, the the use of words, and 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 just you know the sound of of those words that's that's magical. Based on your website, I know you're even more of a car nut than I am. What is it about automobiles, speed, and racing that draws you? And my follow up question is. Can you promise me that we'll see a racer as a protagonist in one of your new thrillers? Well, I can I can promise you I'm going to have a racer as a protagonist in a future book because the the whole world of motor racing and particularly classic car racing is full of skullduggery. There's been murders. There's been a guy jailed in England for smuggling millions of pounds worth of heroin inside classic Ferraris themselves worth 20, 30, 40 million pounds. So it's very fertile ground and it's a ground I know a lot about. So I am definitely going to write a, write a future novel set in that whole world. For me, I've always been a car nut. Ever since I was like a small kid, I had my first accident when I was sitting in my dad's car and we were like, Three, I was three years old, and he was delivering a Christmas present to some friends who lived on a farm. And I was left in the car, so I sat behind the wheel, and I kind of got the parking brake off, and we rolled into a pond. Uh oh! <laughs> and the front of the car went underwater, and I sat there thinking, I wonder if my dad will notice when he comes back. <laughs> <laughs> but more seriously, what for me, you know, writing is very sedentary, and. And I love writing, but it's really important to switch off sometimes. And, you know, I'm a very keen sportsman. I run a lot. I swim. I play tennis. But all the time I'm doing any of those things, or if I'm walking the dogs, I'm thinking constantly about the next pages I'm going to be writing. When I when I race, uh, I turn up the racetrack, and it's all consuming. You know, the moment you arrive at the race circuit, there's scrutineering, there's practice, there's qualifying, there's race itself. And in between, you're watching the kind of playback of the in-car videos. And I don't have time to think because I've got to focus on what I'm doing. You know, it's, it is a dangerous sport, and it's not a sport in which your mind can wander. It can't be approaching a right-hand bend at 130 miles an hour and think, hmm, just, uh, now what should Boy Grace be doing at this point? <laughs> Very true. I come back from a race circuit completely and utterly refreshed. It's like I've been on a fortnight's holiday, and I, and I do some of my best writing in, in the immediate days afterwards. Although I know after the big accident I had in 2013, when I was lucky to, to, to survive, uh, and I rolled four times at 95 miles an hour, I think my agent and publisher would prefer that I took up something safer like knitting, maybe. Mm. <laughs> Makes sense, yes. One final question for you, Peter. You've been interviewed so many times, but if you were able to turn the tables on your readers, what would you ask them? It's a, it's a great question. I think the first question I'd ask them is, because is what what would you like to see in future books? Because I, I love doing talks and doing signings when I when I meet my readers. And hear what they what they think about the characters they like and, and they don't like, um, and I also would like to ask them who their favourite characters are. Um, I'd like to ask them what, in a sense, what what kind. I think all writers we're learning all the time, and I'd love to know what aspects of the books they they like and, they, and that they don't like. You know, do they like reading about the research facts or would they, would they rather just more action? Uh, would they rather more sex? Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to meet the, the, a lady who wrote to me recently saying that, that, that Roy Grace is the only fictional cop she's ever wanted to sleep with. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> that gives us a whole new perspective on readers doesn't it <laughs> well i know you you're offering to give our listeners a brief reading from absolute proof your newest novel which i found extremely riveting so without further ado we'll let you show us what the first chapter is all about okay this is chapter one and it's <clears throat> chapter one starts back uh 
13 years in time. It's January 2005. The downtown L.A. bar was a dump, and that suited Mike Delaney's mood right now. There was one free stool between a middle-aged drunk. Sorry, can I start again? Yes, sure. please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's absolute proof, chapter one, and chapter one is set back uh, 13 years in time. It's January 2005. The downtown L.A. bar was a dump. And that suited Mike Delaney's mood right now. There was one free stool between a middle-aged couple playing tonsil hockey on the right and a surly-looking drunk in a lumberjack shirt, jeans and work boots, hunched over a tumbler of bourbon on the left. Delaney perched on the cracked leather cushion, caught the bartender's eye and ordered a beer. On the wall above was a fuzzy television screen showing a football game with the sound up loud and no one watching. The drunk peered at him with eyes like bloodshot mollusks. No, you don't, I, he slurred. You're the guy from that show, right? Some while back, that, that you, right? Bartender placed a beer in front of Delaney. Paying cash or opening a tab? Or a tab, please. Got a credit card? It was that kind of a place. He used the Amex from his fraying wallet and laid it on the bar. The bartender palmed it. Nicky Magic, right? The drunk said. That was you on television. You, uh, you remember the show? Yeah, you do. It sucked. Oh, thanks, pal. No, you know, I mean... It. How many years back was it? Ten? It was about that. Yeah. Man downed the remnants of his drink. You were crap. I'm all surprised it got dropped, eh? Delaney took a long pull of his beer and ignored him. It wasn't just his show that had been dropped. His agent, an hour ago, had now dropped him too. Now what, kiddo? Al Siegel had said over the phone from his swanky office on Wilshire. You kind of realize you're a dinosaur. I was struggling to get you anything before you went freaked out. Your career's over. Face it, you're pushing 60. Go retire. Move to Palm Springs. Take up golf or something, you know? Hey, I got another call coming in. I have to take. Listen, I'm sorry, kiddo, but that's how it is. Are we done? That's how it is. Boy, did Mike Delaney know that. You were over the hill at 40 here in Tinseltown. When he went to his old haunt, the Magic Castle, hardly any of the magicians there were over 30. He'd screwed up the last engagement that his agent had gotten him, doing close magic at a big movie star's party in Bel Air. Messed up a trick and then lost the plot and threatened to deck the arrogant guy at the table who'd laughed at him. No, no, what I'm saying, the drunk persisted. You, you, you've got to admit, you, you were shit. He appeared at Mickey again. And, and you know what? You look like shit. He felt like shit. The drunk snapped a finger at the bartender. Another Jim Beam double on the rocks. He turned back. Beer, huh? Beer, that's a wuss drink. That's so. The bartender laid down the tumbler filled to the brim with whiskey and ice cubes in front of the drunk. The man raised his glass. You know, you should be drinking proper liquor like this, Mr. No Damn Good Magician. Cheers. He tipped in a mouthful, then almost instantly spat it out. Jesus, he yelled at the bartender. What the hell are you giving me? Oh, uh, Jim Beam, this, this isn't whiskey, it's goddamn beer. Bartender, a tall, sad-looking man in his 70s who had been there forever, shook his head. I'm sorry, mister, you're mistaken. Maybe, maybe you had enough. This is goddamn beer, I'm telling you. You trying to poison me or something? The bartender produced the half-full whiskey bottle and showed it to him. I poured from this. Now, yeah, well, pour another. Irked, bartender produced a fresh glass tumbler. 
and poured from the Jim Beam bottle. To his astonishment, a beer froth rose in the tumbler, all the way to the rim and above, then spilled down the sides. Mike Delaney smiled to himself and said nothing. <laughs> what a reading that so is good fabulous so good thank you thank you that is great and i know that you've got our listeners intrigued this, this is wendy kendall the other half of the the host here on the podcast and i'm a cozy writer but i'll tell you absolute proof is an incredible thriller and i really enjoyed it so much and and thank you for earlier telling us a little bit about how your idea evolved for this book. This book really tackles some very thought-provoking and philosophical issues that are high stakes for potential world-changing impacts. It's truly an action-packed, entertaining crime fiction at its best and with substance. It's a real treat for readers. What are the challenges as an author presenting fast-paced, suspenseful action alongside ideas that you want readers to ponder and reflect on? I think, um, for me always, and, 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 and many of my books, I've kind of written about issues that fascinate me. I've written about designer babies in my novel, Perfect People, and I've written about organ trafficking. And I think the key is to make, to remember always that People want to be gripped. They want to keep turning the page. So much though you may learn something during the course of your research, you've got to learn discipline and, and not bog the reader down for pages and pages and pages of stuff that you as an author have found fascinating. Yeah. Um, but but a more try and make it part of, of, of the overall story. You know, an absolute proof deals with the issue of what – would it? What could it take to convince a hardcore atheist that that God existed? And simultaneously, it deals with you know the the arguments between religion and science. Um, and I've tried to put those arguments through through the eyes and ears and, and mouths of the principal characters by having a range of characters with very different views. So you know, I have. The central character, my protagonist, Ross Hunter, is an investigative journalist working for the Sunday Times. Um, his wife is someone who is a little bit skeptical about religion. Um, one of the hardcore characters is a, is a billionaire television evangelist with churches across America and across England, who is an out-and-out -out fraud, who's just doing this for money. Uh, and and he's, he's terrified that if God were proven to exist, the first thing God would do is make him out to be a fake. Uh, and then, you know, then I have a hardcore scientist who's completely cynical, who's running one of the world's largest pharmaceutical giants, who himself does not believe in God, but who would dearly love to get his hands on Christ's DNA because he thinks that would add huge value to his company's products. <laughs> <laughs> and then lurking, you know, in the background and, and an ever present kind of threat is the Catholic Church, who if you know if, if there's any sniff of proof of God, they want to be the ones to own it and monopolize it. Well, in keeping with the intrigue of absolute proof, as you say, some characters are driven by belief in the almighty dollar or belief in the empire they've built or belief in, in loftier things. Can you talk a little bit more about the power of belief or or the lack of belief in driving your characters' actions? Yes, I mean, I, the, part of my research, I spent five days in a monastic commune in Mount Athos in Greece, um, which is one of the most extraordinary closeted places in, in the world. Um, it was founded in 960 AD, and I'm afraid neither of you ladies would would be able to go there right now because the highest female life form they allow is is a chicken. Ah, oh, <laughs> they only allow female dogs or cats. And before you go, you have to 
present yourself to the monk bureau in Mount Ath- in uh, Thessalonica with three beard monks with sort of beards down to the ground peer at you and check you out to make sure you're not female. And if they've got any doubts, they'd make you drop your trousers. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> and you can only get there by boat and you can only backpack, there are no roads and there's hardly any electricity and the first night I talked to a monk and I said, you know and he was American he, he was actually the guest master at the monastery and I said to him, you know, what what does it take to be a monk and he looked at me and he said to be a monk you have to have absolute faith and I said, you know, what's the shape of your day he said, well, we get he, he He'd started life working for a McDonald's in New Jersey, uh, and then then he drove a long distance truck for a number of years. Then he 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 went out to uh, Greece to see some relatives who were Greek Orthodox, and he had an uncle on Mount Athos, and he went to see him and loved loved the place so much he never left. So I said, hey, "What's the shape of your day?" So well, we get up at two thirty in the morning. Uh, sorry, two in the morning, and we go to the chapel at two thirty, and we pray till six thirty. Then we have breakfast for 15 minutes. Uh, then we pray again until 9 o'clock. Then we do our jobs. He said, I'm the guest master, so I make the beds in the dormitory and do the laundry. And then we pray from 12 till 3. Then we do jobs again until 5. Then we pray till half past 6. We have the evening meal. And then we pray from quarter to 7 till 10, and we go to bed. So I said, you're praying for almost 15 hours a day. He said, yeah. I said, does it ever get boring? And he looked at me and he said, well, all jobs have kind of boring bits. Hmm. I said, praying's a job? He said, sure. He said, you know, we're praying for peace in the world. We're praying to stop the war in Bosnia. Uh, we're pr- you know, and, he, and he kind of went off on a list of things that we're praying for. And I said, but you don't have newspapers. You don't have radio. You don't have television. How do you know what's going on in the world? He said, well, God tells us. Wow. And, and, I, and I got that everywhere. That, that, that absolute, um, complete, utter faith that, that, that almost without that faith, their kind of existence would kind of fall apart. And I found that really fascinating. And then contrasting that with um, the whole kind of atheist wo- world, and, I, and, and, and where there's equally strong kind of passion from people like Richard Dawkins, you know, that there is no God. And one of, the, one of the, the threads I have going through the book is the monkey and the typewriter. And I love this because the monkey and the typewriter theory has been around for some years. And the theory, and it's used by atheists to try to explain how the world came to existence from literally a single cell creature mutating and, and random mutation and, and Darwin's theory of evolution. And the, the-, the theory is that if you sat a monkey in front of a typewriter, and it just typed away, it hammered away at the keyboards forever. One of the combinations of keystrokes would be the complete works of Shakespeare in the right order. <laughs> and the, there was a, an English professor at Cambridge called Anthony Flew, who was uh, 40 years the most hardcore atheist in, in the world. And he was even more hardcore than there was a group known as the Four Horsemen of the New Apocalypse, which was the American Sam Harris, uh, Richard Hawkins, uh, Richard Dawkins, Douglas Dennett, um, and Christopher Hitchens. But uh, Anthony Flew, the Cambridge professor, was even more hardcore. And in 2004, not that long before he died, he changed his mind and he wrote a book called "There Is No God" with a "no" crossed out, replaced with an "a." And two things changed his mind. One was the discovery of DNA by Crick and Watson, who felt, he just felt the complexity of that could never, ever have just come about by random mutation. And the other thing that changed his mind was the monkey and typewriter experiment. A friend of his who was an astrophysicist actually did the experiment in laboratory conditions. He put six monkeys in a cage with a word processor and a perpetual paper feed. And they gave them an incentive to hit the keys. They get a slice of banana every few keystrokes and left them there for 28 days. And 28 days later, they typed 40 pages of TypeScript, of which there wasn't a single intelligible word. There wasn't even an A with a space either side. And Flew's 
astrophysicist friend did the math and concluded that the universe would run out of resources before a monkey typed a single Shakespeare sonnet for 14 lines. And so I've had fun with that in the book as well, and, and, and this character who's doing that experiment. <laughs> yeah, right. 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 Well, <clears throat> Imogen, the protagonist's wife in Absolute Proof, she makes some fascinating choices through the book. Can you talk a little about writing this character? Yeah, I, w I, I wanted to create a character who is someone that I, I've always been fascinated by trust, you know, and, 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 the, and the person you always believe that you can trust, hopefully, is, is, your, is your partner, you know, your husband, your wife, your partner, whatever. And I thought it'd be really interesting to have Ross Hunter, the central character, married to a woman where we don't really know where her loyalty ultimately lies. Um, you know, early on in the book, he comes back from having been covering the war out in Afghanistan to find her in bed with someone. Uh, and, you know, she kind of begs forgiveness. He kind of forgives her. But I always remember Edith Piaf once saying that um, trust is like, like, a, like a, a beautiful glass bowl. Uh, and if that trust ever gets broken, it's like the bowl being smashed and you can glue it back together, but you're forever going to see the joins. And, you know, as the, as the story progresses, the joins in, in that relationship between Ross and Imogen are, are kind of clearly cracked. He starts to suspect when she, she becomes pregnant, uh, she's scared because of all the, all the people who are, seeming now after him, you know, the house is vandalized by a seemingly religious group of religious fanatics. Um, he is offered a big sum of money by a representative of the Vatican to hand over everything he knows, and Imogen wants him to take the money, and so that their lives will be in peace again. And, and you can sympathize with her for that. Uh, but, you know, Ross is determined to see his story through so that there's a sort of constant and growing tension between the two of them to the point where you ultimately start thinking, is she betraying him? Um, so I had a lot of both fun with that, but also I wanted to show what, what trust really means in a relationship and how much can we trust anyone? It, it, make, <clears throat> it makes for very compelling reading. It, it's really incredible. For absolute proof, the tagline, kill to get it, die to keep it, is so fitting for this intense story. Another description that comes to mind for me is, be careful what you wish for. Would you see this cautious saying as having a place within the plot? Well, I've always loved be careful what you wish for. Um, <clears throat> somebody once said the only thing worse, getting, worse than not getting what you want is getting it. <laughs> and I think that <clears throat> I mean when what really the, the, if you like the, the light bulb moment when I was that came to me to, to write this book <clears throat> was when I'd met this old guy who claimed that he had proof of God's existence and I, you know, and I went to see this, this friend of mine the bishop Dominic Walker, and, you know, and I said to him, if somebody credible really did look like they, they, they had proof of God, what would happen? And, anyway, and he said, you know, proof is the enemy of faith. And he said, I think they would be assassinated. And so it, it is very much a sort of poison chalice. And if, <clears throat> you know, I think if any human being, if I was put in Ross Hunter's position, which kind of in a way I was, because this really happened to me. You know, this guy actually came to me and he said, Mr. James, you know, you, you and I have to save the world. And I chose to, to write it as fiction, I guess, rather than act it out in, in real life. So I kind of I had a great deal of empathy with Ross right the way through the, the writing of the story. 
and, and the realization that actually what he had been handed was both probably the most important thing in the history of the human race if it was real but at the same time if it was real he'd also been handed his death warrant wow mm -hmm. yes very heavy well speaking now about your roy grace detective series in your most recent thriller in the series dead if you don't the kidnap victim is a teenager as a reader, I have sort of an extra hurdle to be able to read about children as victims, although it works so well in this book. Are there specific considerations and challenges for an author writing about a child victim in a mystery? I think whatever you write about, <clears throat> you have to kind of write sensitively. Um, I don't think anybody wants to see a child being unnecessarily cruelly treated or tortured. But again, there's always that balance. Um, I I mean, with, with Dead If You Don't, what I kind of, I, I like the sort of the series of twists and, and, and the irony, and, and, and the, the first irony is that this, his father is one of the kind of wealthiest guys in the city, and he's going to take his son to the football game, the big football, first big football game of the, of the season the next day. And we see the dad the night before in the casino, and he's just wiped out financially. He's, you know, he's got a bad gambling habit, and, and he's had his like one final fling. And he takes his son to the football game, knowing in his own mind, shit, this guy I probably ain't going to be able to afford the school fees any longer. We're probably going to lose our house. And then um, he bumps into an old friend. Uh, the, the son's chatting to some friend he's just met. And my, my main character, Kit Brown, turns around, the son's vanished. And an hour later, he gets a text saying, if you ever want to see your son alive again, we want two million pounds in bitcoins, and we'll tell you where to deposit it. And he hasn't got the money. Yeah. Uh, and that's the sort of the first big ironic moment. Yeah. And then I don't, want to, I, don't, I don't want to say the second, because, but it's a massive twist in the story, and I don't want to give that twist away. But I think it that twist kind of makes us smile about the boy and not rather than kind of fear for him at that point. Yes, it's, it's such a good story. I just can't, uh, I can't emphasize enough to the listeners, you want to read this story. <laughs> In Dead If You Don't, your officer Norman Potting talks at one point about when he joined the police. He says, quote, I wanted to try to make a difference once Long ago, I believed in human decency. If you dig deep enough, you can still find some. What are the challenges as an author in conveying hope in your characters? And do your readers have an expectation of hope? Um, I, yeah, I'm a massive optimist about human nature. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, I spend a lot of time out with the police who often, generally fairly negative people you know there's a great quote from a police officer he said you know we are all we're always going into someone's worst situation yes. you know and, and not many people call the police because they're happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and and i think a lot of a lot of police i would say a lot i'd say 99 percent of the police officers i've ever met both in england and america and in other countries they say you know we went into this job because it was a job we felt we could make a difference. And I, we've just become more and more cynical about human nature as it goes on because, you know, they're dealing with scrotes, with scumbags, with villains, people who lie to them all the time. They're not seeing, very rarely seeing, a good side of human nature. You know, they're the ones that get called to a domestic fight and they go through the door and get hit by a chair or fridge thrown at them. You know, they're the ones having to, to break the terrible news that somebody's died. Um, you know, they're the ones who get attacked, shot at. Um, and yet, throughout it all, sometimes things can shine. And I, and I try to show that, that, that side of it, particularly through Roy Grace, who himself, despite all his cynicism, remains, remains an optimist about the human race. And I think one of the nicest stories I personal stories that, I, that I've had. And I try to use thread 
the kind of the, the essence of this through my police characters quite often. A few some years back, I was talking to a young sergeant. She was twenty five, and I said, "You know, how's it? How's the police force been for you so far?" He said, "Well, the first two years was terrific." He said, "I was on response," and he said, "Every cop loves that. You know, you're ripping around town on blue lights." getting in, sort of arresting people, getting in the thick of it. He said, and then they put me onto the street team. And I thought, oh, shite, I'm going to be dealing with winos, with druggies, with the dross of society. And he said, within 18 months, I completely changed my mind. He said, because I realized I could actually help these people. And, I, and he told me the story of a guy he'd arrested on a, on a, on a small drugs charge. And he'd helped this guy get through, get into rehab. And the kid, this guy had now come out of rehab and was working himself in rehab, helping other drug addicts. Mm. And this cop yes. said to me, he said, you know, I actually feel I helped this guy uh, turn his life around. Wow. And how many, wow. jobs, how many jobs can you do that? Wow. wow. Here, Officer Roy Grace is working and coordinating a team, a police force, in this kidnapping investigation. I was intrigued with the pathologist character, Dr. Fraser Theobald, Theobald, sorry, who's part of this force. He preferred his profession because he said it had two big plus points over being a doctor to the living. The first was that you didn't have to make house calls, and the second was that you didn't have to bother with a good bedside manner. Roy Grace says, that he can, quote, trust Theobald implicitly to do two vital things. The first was to establish beyond doubt the cause of death, and the second was to provide evidence that when produced in court would be bulletproof to attacks from even the smartest defense briefs. Can you talk a little about this character, Dr. Fraser Theobald? Yeah, I mean, that <clears throat> first quote came about when I, I talked and became very friendly with a, with a pathologist uh, um, a long time back, actually. Now, when I, I'm getting back about 20 years. And I said to him, what, what made you go into pathology? And he said, and he's quite a gregarious character, actually, this guy. He said, yeah, well, actually, I, I thought it was great. You wouldn't have to make house calls, and you didn't have to have a good side, bedside manner. You know, you could, you could be as rude as you wanted to your patients, and they ain't going to respond back. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but he also said, what I love about it is it's the puzzle, um, the fact that you, you come across a body and maybe that, but you don't know what's happened. And then he gave me a classic example. He said there was a body found in a car wreck and his whole chest was, and he'd gone into, hit a tree, you know, the steering wheel had gone to his chest in the middle of the night. And he said, you know, it was almost one of those situations where you thought, do I actually need a post-mortem? He said, but, you know, it was a jolly good thing that we did because we found that the reason for the car accident was there was a bullet lodged in his heart. Uh, and that's what post-mortems do is they, you know, they, so often, you know, there is a, what seems to be a self-evident death and, and they can un uncover sometimes the truth that somebody didn't die of a natural cause or whatever they they were murdered, and I think that's the big challenge for them, and and the, and the clues that a body can yield, um, you know, from a tiny scraping under a fingernail, which could be a, a defence wound from the victim, um, to even one single carpet fibre, or or hair. Just one tiny, tiny detail, and and and, and that's you know, the good ones are meticulous and invaluable in, in in homicide detection. Yes, you you've really spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, researching with police forces, in particular the Sussex Police. And I was interested on your website to find out that you've donated two police cars to them in 2008 and 2014. Yeah, I um, have Im immense help from Sussex Police, and they, they love it too, because you know, I've, I've quite often have police officers in the books as themselves. Um, but I 
wanted to thank them. And obviously, being a petrol head uh, <laughs> <laughs> or gearhead, I think you may call it in the state, I thought maybe yes, maybe gearhead. <laughs> and I asked the commander of Brighton and Hove one day. I just said, "Listen, I want to want to do something to help. Uh, you know, would you would you?" would you accept the gift of a car? He said, right now with our budget cuts, we'd bite your hand off for one. Um, <laughs> and and it, it went through, it was agreed very quickly by the kind of top brass of the police. And they, they, and they said, you yeah, know, we will liver it up. It will be a full mark police car, but we can have your name emblazoned on it. Uh, the only thing we can't have uh, would be the word dead because in case it goes to, to, a, to a murder. Oh. <laughs> so it's got Pete James, it's got... Peter James, number one, number one for crime, down the kind of sides and on the bonnet, but all the rest, both of them look like Mark police cars. That is fantastic. I love that. Well, investigations nowadays include the immediacy of texts and surveillance electronics and sophisticated tracking and so on. And, and this is not just used by the police, but also by the criminals. How does this either enhance or complicate your writing style? Oh, it excites me because I think the world of policing and the world of villains is forever a game of catch-up. You know, the, the villains get a technological advantage, the police catch up, the villains jump ahead again, then the police get maybe one step ahead. And it time does not stand still. I remember about 12 years ago, <clears throat> I was at the daily... It's, it's a daily management meeting at, at Brighton Police Station. It's nine o'clock every morning. They jokingly call it morning prayers. <laughs> oh. uh, and all the divisional inspectors sit around a ta big table and they review everything that's happened in the last 24 hours, like burglaries, attacks, rapes, um, bail absconders, um, prisoners uh, on remand, and the commander of Brighton and Hove turned to me and he said, Peter, you've come on a historic day. This is the first time since records began there's not, not been an overnight burglary in the city of Brighton and Hove. And I said, why? You've won the war on crime. And he just laughed. And he said, today's villains, he said, everybody now, people have their houses better protected. Most people have security alarms or lights or dogs. They stay up later. And the old school villain who would break into a house and steal your Georgian silver or your collection of art can make 10 times more money now, either as a drug dealer or as an internet fraudster. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said the internet you know, is, is the future of crime. And that was incredibly prescient because right now, 12 years later, you know, internet fraud is the fastest growing crime in the Western world. And you know, I'm sure almost anybody who listens to this has been targeted at some point by an online fraudster. Um, you know, I know I have, and there was a, I got an email from a fan actually in Florida about two years ago saying, Oh, I didn't know you had gone into the real estate business. <laughs> oh. There was, uh, there was on Facebook it was, and everyone on social media. Uh, and, and, and on the web, was as wonderful as Peter James real estate. And there was photos of myself, of Laura, my wife, all kinds of different photographs. And we were selling timeshares in Tallahassee and Orlando. Wow. So, oh, so later, no. if, you, if, you, if you call me after this show I, I, and, bring, you know, and send me a check, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do you a nice deal on a, on a condo <laughs> in Florida. Oh, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Julie, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about the excitement of Thriller Fest. Yes, I am. Well, last July, I attended the annual Thriller Fest conference held by international thriller writers in New York City. Our listeners have often wondered what that's like. So for most of a week, I was based in Manhattan and attended workshops, panel discussions, and keynote addresses. And I learned a lot. Our keynote speaker this year was George R.R. R. Martin of Game of Thrones fame, who turned out to be a hilarious storyteller. Who knew? Unfortunately, I can't repeat any of the stories he told us, but, but uh, trust me, very funny man. I was also fortunate to enroll in Mastercraft Fest, which is an intensive one-day workshop with a best-selling thriller author 
who gives you constructive feedback on the first 10 pages of your completed novel. I, and 10 other students in my class, was blessed with suspense novelist Meg Gardner as our instructor. Now, feedback from an established writer is rare. They're just too busy. But feedback can best be defined as information you need, but may not always welcome. Her comments on my work, however, enabled me to tear down my opening scene and completely rewrite it the way it needed to be. A much more powerful and insightful start to my book. It was truly an aha moment with a light bulb turning on over my head. There's also the chance to hear bestsellers speak, to meet them and ask questions. Seeing Peter James again this year in New York was a true highlight. And there was a memorable address on the topic of revelation by mystery writer Walter Mosley, some words about creativity and writing that I'll remember forever. And then there was pitching to New York agents and editors, always a stressful experience for any writer who wants to be traditionally published. Pitching, for those who've never experienced it, is like speed dating, only for your book. You're trying in 90 seconds to say just enough about your novel to get an agent interested in requesting a partial or full manuscript for evaluation. My outcome was positive. I got requests for my manuscript from all the agents on my list, and in a casual conversation with another agent, she said she wanted to see my historical mystery, now in progress, as soon as it's ready, because it gave her goosebumps. Exactly the reaction I wanted. So, mostly good news, and a lot more work for me. And now, I think Wendy has some information she wants to share with us. <laughs> so, Julie, a writer's work is never done, it sounds like. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, I would like to talk a little about what's age got to do with it. There are practical reasons why genre authors work children into their stories. The crime novel must have proper victims, characters that are e either physically weak or politically defenseless, to enable the detectives to perform like all-out heroes. Vulnerable on both counts, children make ideal victims. Linda Grant, the author of Love Nor Money, which has her San Francisco private eye on the trail of a pedophile, says, no danger that you'll end up feeling sorry for the perpetrator or guilty for catching him. There's something refreshingly unambiguous about child abuse and murder. Children have become useful surrogates for the old-fashioned women who played damsels in distress. An innocent child may be the last sort of valuable victim. If you're writing a cozy mystery, beware writing a child as a direct victim. Generally, it's difficult to balance the typically light tone of a cozy mystery with the heaviness of a victim as innocent as a child. But that's not to say it hasn't been done, but just use caution. Boys and girls in crime stories show the big eyes and quivering chins, have no strong sense of identity, and as victims can't put up much of a fight, which makes them easier targets for sadistic killers. Often the plot hangs on incest or child pornography that reflects the grim reality of a child's world today. Novels of mystery and suspense have the power to tap into the real fears that parents have for their children. It takes brave, thoughtful writers to examine seriously the darker, more ambivalent feelings that parents have for their children. This fiction is driven by our need to demonize what we live in fear of. And we're going to just go right into recommending some mysteries for our listeners today. In addition to Peter James, you can't go wrong with any of the books that he writes. And I'm also going to recommend today The Last Policeman by Ben H. Winters. All is not as it appears right from the start in this novel. It looks like a suicide, and yet rookie detective Hank Pallas isn't sure of that. Still, he wonders what the point is to investigate further. It's only a feeling he has that it could be murder. And what will it matter when the world is certain to end in six months? That's right. <clears throat> the major twist in this novel is an asteroid, which is on a target direct heading to Earth, and nothing can stop it. 
The science is undeniable. The end of the world has been announced. The only questions left are the date and the precise location. Life on Earth has changed with the asteroid news. People, including other police officers, are walking off their jobs to pursue their bucket lists and other end-of-world desperate pursuits. Is there any reason now for Detective Palace to investigate what, by all accounts, appears to be a suicide? With the end of the world a certainty, suicide has become sadly epidemic. Is it really so hard to believe this one? No one else seems to care, including the dead man's family. Is perseverance in this world to do the right thing, despite circumstances, part of human nature? How important is one man's death? It's a fascinating character study to see questions of motive in this new light with the asteroid approaching. The end of the world changes everything from a law enforcement perspective. The dead man worked in the insurance industry, which is affected in its own way by this world news. Is there motive there for murder or motive for suicide? When the detective notifies the man's family, curious dynamics ensue. Ben H. Winters is the author of eight novels, including most recently World of Trouble. The concluding book, in the Last Policeman Trilogy. I highly recommend this book. Peter, I know you're busy with all of your book tour for Absolute Proof, which is just such a great book, but what would you also like to recommend to our listeners? I think that um, if no one's ever read Science of the Lambs, to me, there were, there were two books that changed the face of crime <clears throat> thriller fiction. Um, for me, the first was Graham Greene's novel, Brighton Rock, which, which he wrote in 1937. And, and until that point, very much the kind of murder mystery story was in the Agatha Christie and the kind of golden age writer vein where you tended to have a dead body in chapter one, uh, often in the library of a country house, and then the rest of the book would be the puzzle to solve it. And the characters remain exactly the same throughout, you know, Poirot or, or Miss Marple, be the same at the beginning of the book, same at the end of the book. In Brighton Rock, Graham Greene basically tore up the rule book for crime fiction. Uh, he first of all, he had an incredibly gripping opening line, which was uh, within three hours of arriving in Brighton, Hale knew they meant to murder him kind of have to read on. But then he had as a central character this extraordinary 17-year-old boy called Pinky, who's a child gangster and a murderer, but also a devout Catholic, terrified of eternal damnation. Um, I mean, a wonderful book. It showed me that within the confines of a, of a mystery thriller, you could actually examine much bigger and deeper issues. And that book has probably the darkest, psychologically darkest ending of any novel that's ever been written. Uh, and Science of the Lambs, I think, also changed the landscape. Thomas Harris, when he wrote that book, and I think it's a book every single crime writer, thriller writer, mystery writer, must read and, and almost deconstruct, because where that changed the landscape was up until that point, we tended to have good versus bad. Um, in Science of the Lambs, we ended up with bad versus evil. And that you have, actually, as a central character, an almost hero, a monster in terms of Hannibal Lecter, going after or helping Clara Starling go after an even bigger monster of Buffalo Bill, the Skinner. Two extraordinary books, I think. Good tips. And if our listeners haven't read those, I'd highly recommend them as well. I'm definitely going to look for the one by Graham Greene. Well, my recommendation today is Devil in a Blue Dress by Walter Mosley. Detectives and sleuths are the heart of the mystery suspense genre, so this classic book is a true hard-boiled detective mystery in the best noir sense. Written in 1990, this was Mosley's first novel, winner of a Seamus Award for Best First P.I. Novel. Our protagonist is Ezekiel Easy Rollins, a World War II veteran who comes to L.A. looking for work and finds trouble instead on the mean streets of Watts and in more affluent places. 
Easy's tasked with finding an enigmatic missing white woman, one who spends time in the jazz clubs and bars in the African-American community. Easy's best friend is Raymond Mouse Alexander, called in to help him when the case turns deadly. But Mouse's volatile nature causes Easy to have second thoughts as the body count rises around them. As Easy tracks leads, the trail to find the devil in the blue dress twists and turns, and he discovers that no one is what they seem. This book's a classic because it's one of the first novels in the ethnic detective fiction category, featuring a black protagonist as the detective. Easy's use of African-American English and Walter Mosley's distinctive writer's voice come through at, through the protagonist and the commentary on post-war race relations also makes it a standout. The excellent 1995 film with Denzel Washington as Easy and Don Cheadle as Mouse is riveting as well. In closing, our profound thanks to a Renaissance man, master of suspense, entrepreneur, devoted animal lover, witty raconteur, car fanatic, and award-winning writer and New York Times International bestseller, Peter James, for spending time with us today on our very special 50th episode. He's really gone above and beyond. We often speak about the persistence that's required of all writers, and I know Peter wrote his first eight novels before deciding to become a full-time author. So my message to our listeners is keep reading and keep writing. Thank you so much for joining us today, and be sure to look for absolute 